today's topic, the importance of decentralized off-grid communications. This one's kind of out there, but it's important. In today's episode of Off-Grid Ham Radio, we're talking about censorship, propaganda, and our ability to freely disseminate news and information with one another in a world where big tech and corporate media are much more likely to share opinions supporting unpopular narratives rather than the objective news and journalism we've expected in the past. Stick with me and I'll explain to you why off-grid communications has become critical to maintaining our free speech. Okay, here we go. You are listening to the emergency broadcast systems this station broadcasts emergency news and official information on the air for a sign narrative. When we're thinking about censorship, we think about it in terms of changing or the suppression or prohibition of speech or even writing that is deemed subversive of the common good. My problem with all this is who decides what should be suppressed? Who decides what should be prohibited? Who gets to decide what is considered subversive or not? of biased and false, false news has, has become, become all, all too common, common on, on social, social media. media. More alarming, some media outlets publish these things simply aren't true without checking facts first. Unfortunately, some members of the media use their platforms to push their own personal bias and agenda to control exactly what people think. And this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. The 2012 version of the National Defense Authorization Act, or NDAA, included an amendment legalizing the use of propaganda by the American government on the American public. This had global implications. The amendment, proposed by Mac Thornberry, a Republican from Texas, and Adam Smith, a Democrat from Washington, passed the House. The result was nullifying the Smith-Mund Act of 1948 an act which explicitly forbids the United States government from performing information or psychological operations aimed at influencing U.S. public opinion. Bottom line, they made it legal to mislead the American public. The result of this is a sort of collaboration or cooperation between big tech, Hollywood, corporate media, and Uncle Sam, all in an effort to control the narrative. Now, a big part of the story is fact checkers will tell you this part of my story is false. However, as we begin understanding who is actually funding the fact checkers, we understand the reason they might do so. Now, a controlled narrative isn't the only problem. We also have a problem with censorship. We saw this playing out over the past couple of years as those speaking out with a narrative countering the government's own narrative were shut down on social media for doing so. Love him or hate him, now, thanks to Elon Musk, and the release of the Twitter files, we can see the Biden White House was pressuring Twitter to both elevate or suppress users based on being for or against the government narrative. Well, why should I care about this, Julian? I'm not in America. Well, that doesn't really matter because big tech, often at the behest of government, operates globally. Now, back home, we have something called the Constitution. The First Amendment of the Constitution says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right for the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Once again, we can thank Elon Musk and a few brave journalists for publicly outing the federal government and their censorship campaign. We can see that the federal government, along with federal agencies like the FBI, have implemented a surveillance and censorship program in direct conflict with the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. So what's the point of all this, Julian? Well, I'm actually happy you asked. Normally on this channel, when we're talking about communications, off-grid communications, emergency communications, communications for preparedness, we're doing so to save lives and or property during a grid down scenario or disaster. Now, it may not be completely apparent, but an attack on free speech, whether in America or someplace else in the world, is also a critical disaster scenario. 
Today's threat is different but no less dangerous. It's presented as a means of combating misinformation by big tech, corporate media, and the federal government, which is extremely worrying. I've always been taught having a discussion, even with someone you don't agree with, was always a good thing because it allows both of us to understand the perspective of the other. This dialogue is being shut down on social media. This all reminds me of an old proverb which says, The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Unfortunately, these intentions, whatever the motivations behind them, are preventing us from sharing our collective experiences with one another. What could have been started as an effort to prevent panic in the public has obviously gone too far. Now here's a connection to off-grid two-way radio. Two-way radio is just as important to free speech as the printing press and express writers were in early America. We can use two-way radio for sounding the alarm or getting the message through, but only if we know how to use these tools effectively. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about talking politics over the radio. But there definitely are innocent topics which get flagged as subversive when in actuality we're simply trying to pass along good information. I refuse to allow the government and big tech to work together deciding what I can or can't say. So if my messages are flagged on social media, why am I not using radio to send that message out? Moreover, why do we keep putting our faith in these centralized services which act as gatekeepers to our speech? I believe it's just like Pavlov's dogs. We've been conditioned to want our daily fix of cat videos, bikinis, and politicians pretending they're not all in the same uni party. Naturally, we also want it in 4K. Ultimately, though, social media is simply designed to be a distraction. For those watching the video version of this, I've been composing an email in the background for the past few minutes. If you were able to read some of it, you'd understand this type of message is the type that would be censored over social media. If this message was going out on Facebook, for example, it could be censored. If it was going out as a public post on Facebook, it could be sanctioned. If this post was going out on Twitter before Elon Musk, it could get you banned. Look, if you've made it this far in the video and you've been around the channel for a while, you'll already understand the importance of context in a video. So hang on a little bit longer, and if you haven't done so already, hit that like button. The problems we have today with social media, corporate media, and corporate news is centralization. Corporate media works fine for breaking news like a fire or a plane crash. Beyond this, the gatekeepers will shut down any dissent or a narrative that goes against the approved narrative. This is when users get shadow banned or even worse, totally banned from the platform. This is the problem with centralization. It's not your platform, and some bureaucrat decides whether or not you can share what you'd like to share. Ham radio operators have been using off-grid communications to share files for a very long time. This was especially true back in the packet radio days where we had packet BBS servers radio operators could log into over the air. Although that functionality was awesome, it's not exactly what I'm talking about now. What I am talking about now is over-the-air blogging. Now, I'm not talking about full-size web servers or things like that. I'm talking about micro-blogging and the ability to share posts directly on our stations. Before I go into that further, let's get a couple of things out of the way. It's critically important to understand we need to keep talking to one another, person to person, station to station, in real time. Now, I'm not talking about talking politics on the radio. I'm talking about passing along good information to friends, family, group members, information they haven't necessarily heard. Now, that's for real-time communications. For asynchronous communications, we need to take a little bit of a different approach. Now, when I say asynchronous communications, this simply means communications which are not done in real time. Now, there's a few very good examples of this, but by far, WinLink is the best example. Another incredible example is JS8 Call. Now, there's also VAR, AC, Ion 2G, FSQ, and so on. For now, JS8 Call is probably the best solution to make this demonstration. Now, JS8 Call and VAR AC both have features which allow an operator to query another station to get information back from them. 
Now, if you've already used JS8 call, it's easy to imagine how we would use this query function to our advantage. With JS8 call, you can query a station, specifically query a station and say, uh, for example, what's my signal report? Or do you have any messages for me? The station, as long as it's on, can actually reply by itself, answering the question from the station who sent the query. Now, at the moment, I'm sending a message query to a station where I know there's a message waiting for me. Now, if we use this message query to conceptualize the idea of over-the-air blogging, it doesn't have to be, for example, a message. It, it could be something like a tweet. So from this perspective, think about sending a query to a station who's hosting specific files. So let's make believe for a moment that I'm not asking for a message stored in that station, that I'm asking for the most recent posts. We could send a query to that station and say, do you have any new posts, for example? Just like the station is sending me the message that's stored on his station for me, that could be a list of new posts from that operator. We can think about it like an index for a blog website or an over-the-air off-grid library. Now keep in mind, we're still pretending this message is a post stored on Oscar Golf 8 Zulu. The post is about the Yezu FT818 being discontinued, but in actuality, the topic of that short post could be anything. From the radio blogger's perspective, posts are written and stored in a folder on his or her own station. We write a short text post, perhaps a little bit longer than a tweet. We add references and source material, whatever is needed to get the point across, and we share it with a title and date in that shared folder. When operators are curious whether or not you have any new posts on your station, they simply query it the same way we query messages in the JS8 call network. The hosting station will send you a reply with the with a listing of the latest posts stored on that station. Beyond this, you can go ahead and query that post's ID to have it directly downloaded to your own station for reading. The hosting station never actually broadcasts that it has posts stored on its station. It's up to the individual operator to query if posts are there or not. This way, we're not adding a bunch of unnecessary traffic to the JS8 call network while still allowing operators to host and share posts with the network. At least I'm hoping that's how it will work. Another functionality I'd like to see is the ability to select all call as we have in JS8 call so that we can ask all the stations simultaneously if anyone has any new posts. This means people who aren't interested in these posts aren't bothered by a constant stream of broadcasts announcing them. Now that was JS8 call. This is var AC. Var AC also has functionality which is very similar to the functionality we're talking about with this micro blogging concept. Var AC allows you to compose vmail messages. These messages can be sent uh, in real time or they can be stored in your station for later reception when that receiving station queries your station. All of these vmails were sent to my station while I was actually away. The station was running, but the process of receiving or ingesting these vmails was automated with var AC. So you see, getting this microblogging concept up and running is not very far away at all. So now I'll compose a message for Hotel Bravo 9 Alpha Victor Kilo. Now, although this is still a message and the functionality doesn't exist for microblogging yet, you can still see how this composition form could be used to compile a microblog. You just have to have a little bit of imagination. So while I'm compiling this message, let's finalize this video. I'm not trying to bring politics into amateur radio, but I am trying to use amateur radio for critical communications. For me, it doesn't matter if it's a hurricane, earthquake, some other type of disaster, 
or if it's an attack on our free speech. I believe in any of these examples, we can use amateur radio to get our messages through as we normally would with social media. The difference with amateur radio is we don't have the bandwidth like we do over a Wi-Fi network, or over Starlink, or some other rapid, fast internet connection. For microblogging and messaging over the air, we need to use our bandwidth efficiently. Short text messages with links, things like that, like tweets, where every station can actually host and post these microblogs over the air. Now, what we need to do is make such a big fuss about this functionality, of course, if we agree with the need for the functionality, and get developers to add this type of functionality to JS8 Call, to VAR AC, even to WinLink. I believe every station should be able to disseminate good quality information to their communities. We shouldn't have to be afraid or have to rely upon centralized communications as we have in social media to get our messages through. Now, I know there's going to be those operators who say, hey guys, hold on, this is not what amateur radio is all about. I would argue that this is exactly what amateur radio is all about. And moreover, I would say that it's up to us, amateur radio operators, to adapt to the needs of a changing world. This idea of micro blogging over the air with amateur radio is useful on so many levels for so many different things. What I need from you all is your support. Help encourage amateur radio developers, JS8 Call, VAR AC, and WinLink to implement this microblogging technology or concept in these applications. Now, if you don't see any point to what we're trying to do here, just ignore this video and keep on walking by. For the rest of you who might be intrigued by this concept, remember, when I introduced the concept of asynchronous communications, asynchronous data communications in the YouTube ham radio community, that playlist I shared was a hit. I think 11,000 of you have viewed that entire playlist by now. So if you're interested in that asynchronous data communications for emergency communications, this step isn't that much further away from where we are now. All we have to do is get the developers on board. All right, guys, look, because of the nature of this video, I'm going to skip putting the supporters names up on the screen for this video. Instead, I'll say thank you to my YouTube members and patrons and everyone else who is helping to support my work on this channel and the blog. For the rest of you, let me know what you think. Do you like this concept of over the air micro blogging? Do you think it'll work? Do you have some ideas to add to it? Leave your comments in the comments below, and the only thing I ask is that you be polite. Alright guys, if you like what I'm doing, if you like the content I'm creating, please leave me a comment and or a thumbs up to let me know. And if it's not too much to ask, please share this. Well, actually, let me stop there. Please, guys, seriously, please share this video someplace where someone or other operators can enjoy it. Rock and roll, guys. I appreciate you watching and I appreciate your support. Thanks again. Ciao.